Welcome back to another episode of Heart of the Matter. Today we are honored to welcome to our show, Dr. Emily Towns. Dr. Towns is a distinguished scholar and leader in theological education. She is currently the Dean of the Divinity School at Vanderbilt University and a professor of womanist ethics and society, a field in which she is considered a pioneer. Dr. Towns is the current president of the Society for the Study of Black Religion, as well as the former and first female African-American president of the American Academy of Religion. She is the recipient of the 2015 Martin Luther King Jr. keynote at Bowdoin College. Dr. Right. Towns, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. It's safe to say that Americans' relationship and observance of religion has changed over the years. Christianity is still the dominantly practiced religion in the United States, but a 2014 report from an NPO reveals that 22% of the American population considers themselves religiously unaffiliated, which has gone up from 16% in 2007. What do you believe has caused this change over the years? I think there's several factors. Uh, perhaps the most important one or the one that um, I hear folks talking about the most and certainly listening to the students that who come our way is that um, there's a lot of infighting that's going on in denominations around issues of sex and sexuality, race and racism, uh, that the younger generation doesn't see as an issue, doesn't understand why, and they're looking for other outlets to express their spirituality other than organized religion. And um, I think that's an indictment. How do you describe the evolution of Christianity in the last 15 years? Well, it's become certainly more global, but that was, that's been happening really since, I would say, the early 1800s as denominations went here, hither and yon, uh, Christianizing different populations across the globe. What has happened, though, uh, in the last 15 or so years is a lot of those folks have had uh, generations beyond those early settlers, those early folks who were missionized, and they have a form of Christianity that is much more conservative than what we often see in the United States. So in some ways, some of what we did years ago um, is appearing now in, uh, in folks who are from different parts of the world. And uh, we're having to have more of a dialogue with those folks because they have uh, numbers, growing numbers, and perhaps uh, one could say if you looked at it globally, there's more folks outside our borders than inside our borders who understand themselves to be Christian. And they have a very different understanding of what that looks like. Pope Francis has been celebrated as a breath of fresh air for the Catholic Church because there's a message of change, but it's clear that not everyone's on the same page as him. In recent news, the Archbishop of San Francisco made news when he told teachers at four Catholic high schools in the Bay Area that they could not publicly challenge the church's teachings on homosexuality, contraception, and stem cell research. What do you make of this? Is this a step backwards? Well, that bishop has been very consistent in what he believes, uh, and the surprise was he was appointed to San Francisco of all places. He has been a very outspoken opponent of same-sex marriage for years. Uh, so this was not unknown. Um, so I'm a little mystified, and this actually happened before Pope Francis was um, elevated to the Pope ship. But um, in 2012, I think he was appointed bishop there. Um, so this is the last papal administration who did that. Um, and so it was somewhat of a mystery uh, why you would set up a potentially contentious situation, knowing that the population of the city was going to run counter to the uh, spoken stances and beliefs of the bishop in charge, or the archbishop in charge. So um, I make of it as politics as usual uh, in any denomination where you have the back and forth, the give and take, the dissension and the, um, and the, the um, issues of obedience are all mashed together in that situation. And um, 
I am, uh, I am not sure what direction it's going to go. How would you assess the state of ordination of women in the clergy? Is it an accurate statement to suggest that American nuns are treated as rebels by the Vatican? If you speak to most nuns, they will tell you they're being faithful. They're following Christ. Um, and I believe, and I believe them. I believe that is what they understand their ministry to be about, um, and that they are trying to be obedient to their vows. Um, and so when you look at women in ministry in the Catholic Church, and for instance in my own denomination, American Baptist, women have always been ordained. The question was, be appointed to churches? And that's still a question. But when you look um, at the Catholic Church, there's a long history of um, women speaking out of their call to ministry. And um, it wasn't always this way in the Catholic Church. There was a time when there was no distinction between male and female and who could serve. But as churches get more institutionalized, practices come in, and we think they've been that way all the time when it actually hasn't been the case. As the Mike Brown and Eric Garner protests in Ferguson, New York, proceeded this past year, there seemed to be an absence in the public eye of a missing voice of leadership in the black community. Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton no longer have the influence that they once had. Does the Christian black community need a modern day Martin Luther King Jr.? And if so, is there a person on the horizon who might play the, this role? Or is this need for a great man, a relic of the past? I would say what Black Lives Matter campaign has shown us is that this is a different generation of organizers in the black community and their allies, which is not a centralized model, but it is intentionally decentralized because there's so many issues that need to be tackled at once. It's not just police policing and police brutality. It's also the prison industrial context, con complex. It's also race and racism. It's housing, it's jobs, it's healthcare. The list just goes on and on. Um, women's right to choose. It's all a piece of the fabric. And so folks have begun, I believe, to appreciate, and this is coming from the younger generation, not my generation, not the one just behind me, or the one right behind that, but the younger generation folks who are living um, lives that are complex, they don't see the easy solutions that so many folks would like to offer them, and they're taking on the complexity full force. The one thing that I do know is true about Ferguson is that the black Christian community was present. Uh, lots of local churches were very active in uh, providing shelter and resources and bodies and part of strategizing sessions for the um, young markers, marchers in Ferguson and across the country. It just doesn't have the big name figures, which I think is actually a good thing, uh, frankly, because uh, I think one of the things that is most important for us to recognize today is that the people we're waiting for are us. It's not a savior, it's not a big public figure. It's those of us who are right there, right now, living and struggling and trying to make the world a better place. We're the ones we've been looking for. And uh, that's what's been going on in Ferguson, Staten Island, Detroit, Kansas City, Nashville, all these places where you see folks rising up and saying enough. We've had it. New York Times op-ed last summer asserted that My Brother's Keeper, the White House initiative that gives mentorships, internships, and other means of support to young men of color uh, doors the issues of African-American girls. Does this country need a My Sister's Keeper? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a no-brainer. Uh, it may not have the same designs, nor should it have the same kinds of programs because girls' issues are slightly different. But um, youth need mentors. And those of us who are older need to learn how to mentor better. And everyone needs to learn how to listen to each other. And if you can develop a program that does all those things 
and gives, gives youth a chance to get out of their teen years and out of their 20s and out of their 30s, which are the, the major years of where you see a lot of teen death, great. Um, but boys and girls need people in their lives who are not going to abuse them, take advantage of them, or sell them down the river for fame and glory, but to really stand in the gap with them and help them grow up. It's Every year, there's a lot of focus on Martin Luther King Jr. and in light of the Selma movie, there's been a, a renewed discussion of, of his legacy. 2015 also marked 90 years since Malcolm X's birth. How would you describe his impact for the African-American community? Has time changed how we view him? I think there's more a better appreciation of who he was in the years that have passed. One of the important books that helped bring that out was uh, the theologian, uh, the black theologian James Combs Martin and Malcolm in America. Um, and one of the things that James Cone is able to show in that book is that these two men were starting to see each other's positions more clearly, just as their lives were cut, cut short, um, and appreciating the fact that they needed to learn how to work together, that the issues they saw in the country were far bigger or far larger than a single solution either one of them was offering. But both had um, important insights into the soul of the, of, the, of the country and how we should address it. So um, both men matured, they changed, um, and certainly um, Malcolm's life was an example of that. And um, the, one of the things that I appreciate so much is that he's no longer being painted by many some still do, as a sort of demagogue, when in fact he was making incisive social commentary and critique on the nature of black lives in the U.S. and then the implications for that for the rest of us. We always enter, enter interviews with a, a rapid round of questions, hmm. and I'd like to ask you, who's a religious figure that you admired the most? My grandmother. He, was she a part of the church? Absolutely. She opened the doors of the church and closed them every Sunday. Wonderful. If you could suggest a book for the Bowdoin community to read, what would it be? Hmm. Oh man, there's so many. Um, I tend to go to novels, and just about any novel by um, Toni Morrison, and any essay by James Baldwin. What is the most rewarding part for you of teaching religion to youth? Helping them understand that their questions are okay. That uh, there should be no question that's off, off base. Uh, if you've got it, you should be able to ask it and ask it with the confidence that you won't be um, shouted down or looked down upon, but that the question is genuine. More, more often than not, it's the adults who are afraid of the questions. God's not afraid. So, I'm giving them permission to do that. Dr. Han, thanks for being here. Well, thank you. I'm Gabriel Frankel, and this has been Heart of the Matter from Bone and Cable Network. We'll see you next time.